everybody, everybody, it's Dr. Joe, and uh, on this uh, Wednesday evening, I hope all is well wherever you are, and uh, and so on. So uh, let's have a look. Where are we? So uh, today's the uh, August the second, and I'm off to Canada tomorrow, and for what they call Caravana, it's like a Caribbean festival, and uh, partying and enjoying life, as they say. It's a Caribbean festival. I expect like a million visitors in Toronto. So we're going to go there and check it out for a week. And uh, so I'm so looking forward to that one. And then around, I think, towards the end of the month, I'll probably do another networking event at one of my properties in Washington, D.C. So if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, look out for, uh, you know, closer to the time, uh, probably uh, the last Saturday of the month. I think it's all around the 26th or something like that. Uh, I'll be doing a, uh, a a networking event at one of my properties. If you can come over and see it, and uh, we should have some time and uh, just talk and uh, answer all your questions that you may have. So stay tuned, as the saying goes. Anyway, let's have a look. So today we are going to talk about rent, collecting rent, and uh, maximizing rent collections. <clears throat> Tips for the serious, serious landlord uh landlord who is running and operating as a business and not just sort of uh, messing around but they are taking it seriously and uh, obviously they have expenses and the other way you can offset the expenses is to collect rent so that's what we're going to talk about i'm going to give about 10 or 12 different tips uh, which hopefully you'll be able to use and these uh tips and suggestions were developed over 35 plus years and believe me i've had tenants from heaven and i've had tenants from hell and it's like getting rent is like squeezing turnip uh, squeezing blood out of a stone i think they call it here that's the saying you know it's just like a a constant i don't know you're fighting with them and uh, and so on so we're going to talk about strategies that i've learned to hopefully help you uh, collect your rent on time without a whole lot of drama, without a whole lot of fuss and fighting, and uh, and so on. So let's just get down to it. And uh, don't forget, uh, towards the end, we're gonna have the um, uh, you know Ask Doctor Joe Q and A session. So get your questions together, and I will try to answer them towards the end of today's session. So maximizing rent collection. Insider tips for the serious landlords. So what in the world are we talking about? Okay, so for landlords, you know, the bottom line is this. Maintaining a successful business is going to require that you, um, you know, you collect rent. And uh, because it provides you with cash flow and it enables you, as we all know, to cover our expenses, whether it be taxes, insurance, maintenance, repairs, uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, we need to offset that with income coming in. And it also allows you to make improvements to the house. So, for one, for example, one of the houses I'm uh, going to have the networking event. Uh, you know, the tenant just recently left after eight years, and uh, so we do some upgrades to the house. And uh, obviously, I can't do that uh, unless I have income coming through from other properties. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go into my pocket and so on. So we need uh, income rent for to collect to offset uh, expenses, also to make improvements uh, to the property. And uh, so in this live stream, we're going to cover about things like how to optimize rent collection, uh, how to foster what I call good tenant relationships, and also to allow you to ensure your long-term success uh, as a buy and hold investor, landlord, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so let's let's get to it. Number one tip. <coughs> Sorry about that. Is to set clear and what I call transparent rent policies. Okay, so set clear and transparent uh, rent uh, policies. So what does that mean? It means that it should be clear how much the rent uh, the tenant is going to pay you or the tenant is responsible for from the outset. And uh, also uh, what dates are the rents due? Is it on the 1st or 5th or whatever it is? Uh, that needs to be clear. And also communicate the process by which you should, they should pay you and how you're going to collect the rent, okay? So we have to set uh, clear uh, policies <clears throat> in terms of, from the outset, in terms of what is the rent, um, you know, when is it due, and how they're going to pay you and how you're going to collect it, okay? 
And, uh, and my suggestion is to offer multiple payment options. And that's something which I do. And uh, what I mean by that is that nowadays, I mean, I remember a long when I first started, I used to go out and knock on people's doors to collect rent. You know, um, and <laughs> I'll go there and knock on the door. Nobody answers the door, obviously. And uh, the lights go off. And uh, I can hear little whispers behind the door. Psst, psst, psst. The rent man's here. Be quiet, everybody. And, you know, and then um, 10 minutes later, I leave. And then 15 minutes later, the lights are turn back on again. So, so I don't do that door knocking, collecting rent in real time. I do everything electronically. Uh, I use online platforms, uh, for example, Cash App, Venmo, Zelle. And uh, I used to do bank transfers where I'll give the tenants uh, my bank account and they'll transfer the money directly into my account. And also you can do what we call automatic uh, deductions, which I'll talk about a bit later on. <clears throat> but the idea is to offer multiple payment options to the tenant. So it encourages them. <clears throat> uh to pay on time and also provides them with different convenient options um because for one person uh cash app may be good another person's l is better uh venmo may be another preferred way so i like to provide multiple ways in order for the tenant to pay me okay and uh you know and i i found that especially a lot a lot of my voucher tenants cash app seems to be very very popular most of my tenants in fact pay by cash app uh i'm not too sure why um but uh cash app is a preferred way and i don't really have many people pay by venmo but i also have quite a few people pay by zelle and uh also you need to you know employ uh, what i call late fees and uh which i'll just you know discuss that later on uh the importance of having late fees and so on so that's number one is to set clear and transparent um rent policies number two is to communicate effectively with tenants communication is the is the heart of all your landlord tenant relationships that i found uh good communication is really really helpful uh you know you're going to have issues with tenants <clears throat> and if you can have an environment whereby you feel comfortable calling them they feel comfortable calling you texting you emailing you then you have an open door open policy of communications that's really really good because it builds i think trust and uh, support. And uh, I found that uh, the old school way, which is I don't want to hear from my tenants, I don't want to see them, all I want is their money. Uh, that's okay. But, you know, I found that, you know, leaving the channels of communication open is really, really helpful. I check in with my tenants every now and then just to make sure they're okay and uh, make sure they're happy. I have uh, tenant surveys, which we now develop and send out to our tenants just to kind of gauge how they're doing uh, on, you know, and, and you know, I'll tell you. So we we ask the tenants to rate their happiness uh, with the property um, on a scale of one to five, and uh, essentially they're assessing me. And uh, we're about we're we're averaging around four point six or four point seven on a scale of one to uh, one to five with our tenants to their satisfaction. I do that because I want to make sure that they're happy, and uh, if they're not happy, I want to know why. And so, therefore, I can put mechanisms in place. So, communicate re regularly is very, very important. <clears throat> so, in terms of rent, what it means is that you need to communicate with them when is the rent due, and uh, you know, and uh, how they're going to pay. And uh, you can communicate different ways. You can communicate by email. You, you communicate by text, voicemails, call them. Uh, but whichever your preferred way, uh, it's up to you. Uh, some people are purely electronic, whether it be uh, text and phone uh, or text and email. I like, uh, you know, um, calling them and uh, every now and then that is. And, uh, you know, when I call them, I'm very professional. Uh, I usually refer them by their, um, you know, Miss So-and-so, Miss Jones, Miss Smith, Miss Clark or whatever it is. I don't usually call them by their first name. Uh, again, just a, a, a matter of courtesy and respect. And uh, I want the tenants to feel comfortable talking to me. And uh, if there are issues in terms of their rent collection, I want them to either feel comfortable calling me, letting me know beforehand that there's going to be an issue, there's going to be a problem. And I, you know, they should feel comfortable with me calling them or texting them about the, you know, the rent. So, uh, you know, so it's really important to establish a, a good line of communications. Because that can also prevent uh, confusion, misunderstanding. Also, I think will help you in your rent collection process. 
You also, you can be proactive. Uh, so if there's going to be an issue, if they feel like comfortable to talk to you, then you can at least resolve the issue, whatever it is, before it gets out of control. Okay, so that's number two, which is to communicate effectively with tenants. Number three is to offer incentives for on-time payments. Um, this is, I mean, I was having a conversation with one of my uh, relatives about this, and they don't believe in this. Uh, they feel that, you know, their position is, hey, the tenants got to pay their rent. I don't need to offer any incentives. That's their responsibility and so on. So that you can do that. Uh, you can take that position. Uh, what I found is that for some tenants, it's, 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 there's value in offering them incentives, you know, uh, for timely payments. And uh, some people have what we call reward programs. So if uh, the rent is paid on time for, let's say, six months or 12 months, you can offer them a little discount uh, as a thank you. And, um, you know, I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying that's what some people do. And uh, again, it's to promote, uh, let them know that you're, you're grateful that they're paying on rent on time. And uh, this is a measure uh, of goodwill. Uh, I'll give you a little uh, either, uh, you know, reduction or here's a kickback or, you know, a little thank you uh, and so on. Rewards. OK, so that's number three. Offer um, incentives for on time payments. Number four is uh, which is I think I mentioned this earlier on. Enforce late fee policy fairly. OK, it's really important to have a late fee policy and that should be in your lease. And uh, and if you're going to have it, it should be applied consistently and fairly across the board. OK, and uh, because you don't want to do it whereby you're especially if you're in a multifamily building where you implement late fees for one person, but not the other person or you waive it for one person. But don't, not the, I mean, you can create some. Um, you know, uh, you know, frustrations or you can face some animosities if you don't apply it across the board fairly. So if you're going to have late fee policy, then implement it across the board fairly and, uh, you know, and adhere to it. Uh, be consistent. Uh, but also, again, before communication, make sure you're approachable such that if they need to communicate with you to explain why they're running late or why they're going to pay late, then at least, um, you know, you can agree beforehand. And, and then you can make a determination whether you should uh, apply a late fee or waive a late fee and so on. Uh, number five, which is a really important one. Uh, to me, as you all know, uh, I'm into screening. Uh, I think screening tenants is absolutely critical. Uh, most of your problems, uh, I think, are the root of it is you just happen to have the wrong person in your house. So screening allows you to hopefully avoid having the wrong person in your house. And, uh, you know, and, you know, you, there are tenants who are consistently late payers. There are tenants who just don't pay. There are tenants who destroy your home. There are tenants that are just tenants from hell. And if you don't screen, uh, you may end up with one of those. And uh, if you end up with one of those, your life can be miserable. Uh, it can be a source of frustration. And uh, it makes you want to get out of this business. So how do you screen? I think we've done the sessions on that before. You know, check obviously credit histories, rental history. Uh, I make home visits. You can check their employment history and things like that. And uh, if you speak to current and previous landlords, they will tell you, hopefully, if they pay their rent on time, if they don't, and if they take them to court, uh, if so, how many times, and, uh, and so on. So screening is really, I think, the key to, um, you know, having a successful, uh, you know, payment history with your tenants. Uh, number six. Okay. Well, anyway, before I get to that one, uh, again, we're going to have a Q and a session shortly. So please, uh, put your questions in the chat box and I will get to them. And, uh, shortly after here. So again, put them in your chat box and, uh, into the questions there and I'll try to answer them very, very shortly. Okay. So number six, automate rent collection, automate rent collection. So what do I mean by that? is uh, you want to streamline your operations such that the money goes from their account into your account as smoothly as possible. Avoid what we call friction. Uh, reduce the chances of human errors and delays Okay, in getting your rent. So there are various uh, online payment platforms out there. Uh, you can do a Google search for that. Uh, I don't really do that, but I know some uh, management companies do. There are some software uh, that allows you every month to essentially take money from the tenant's account directly into your account. Uh, so as long as there's money in the account from the tenant's perspective, it's almost like an ACH. 
uh, as long as there's money in the account, then you already establish a payment arrangement whereby it goes from their account and transfer it into your account. Okay, so that's automated. And uh, so there's quite a few tools that allow you to do that. And uh, you may want to check. I don't really do that too much for my voucher holder tenants. You, that could be something that you may want to consider for your market rent tenants if you have them. And uh, because, uh, you know, it can, uh, these payment platforms can reduce and simplify the payment process for both landlords and the tenants. Uh, there was a time I recall from some of my uh, market renters whereby, um, you know, they would set up a, almost like a, a payroll transfer. So when they would get paid, which could be either twice a month or every other week, then part of that pay would go from their account uh, to my account. And uh, and so on. So we, they, they, I would fill, or they would fill out a form, and from me, and then they'll then send it to their HR department, human resources department, uh, to actually set up this payment plan where it goes directly from their salary or or pay directly into my account. I I used to do that quite a bit with my market renters. I, I haven't done that too long, uh, but that's some that's that's a way to automate uh, the rent process. And then number seven is you may want to implement what we call uh, implement grace periods. Uh, for me, the grace period is from the first to the fifth, midnight on the fifth. If the rent is paid by uh, the, the midnight, the fifth day of the, each month, then you know there's no late fees. Uh, but if it's paid after midnight on the fifth, then there's a, a late fee that's applied to their account. And I enforce the late fees. Uh, I used to kind of waive them and and didn't really, you know, apply them. But now it's across the board. I do it. And um, but again, you've got to make sure that your lease allows that. And so it should be documented in writing and readily available to the tenant, um, especially if they're going to dispute it or they take you to court. Uh, then you want to make sure that it's in your lease and they've actually signed the lease. Some jurisdictions limit how much the late fee can be. Uh, some places it's 5%, some places of the rent, uh, some places it's, it's up to you, whatever you agree to. Okay. So just make sure that you're in compliance with your state and local, uh, lo uh, laws as it pertains to, uh, late fees and grace periods and things like that. Um, so again, in, 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 in very, very unusual mitigating circumstances, I sometimes do waive uh, a late fee or give, extend the grace period. Uh, especially if it's a tenant who always pays on time, but they just happen to run into an issue for that one month. So I may sort of be a bit lax for them. Uh, not lax, sorry. I may waive uh, the late fee or extend the grace period uh, when the rent is due. Uh, but obviously, if it's an habitual late payer, then I don't do that. I just apply the, uh, the late fees all the time. Uh, whatever you do, number eight is to uh, you know put all your policies in writing. Um, it, it, you know, verbal stuff doesn't work. Uh, you got to have it in writing, especially if there's a dispute. Um, uh, because if you have to go to court, uh, the judges want to, wants to see, uh, whatever, you know, you're arguing for in writing. If it's not there and it's verbal, then it's probably not worth anything. And you may not, you may lose your, um, your case. So, um, you know, have it documented, ready, available. And, uh, I say, I would strongly recommend that you include it in the lease. And uh, I create a tenant handbook uh, when I give to my tenants. So you want to make sure it's in there as well. Number nine is cultivate a uh, positive relationship with the tenants. As I, I kind of mentioned this earlier on, uh, a lot of problems that you can have, uh, that you have as a landlord is because of a, uh, you know, a bad relationship. And uh, it's an adversarial relationship, you know. And uh, so what I do, as you know, I take, I, 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 I view this as very important, which is to take the time and effort to cultivate positive relationships with my tenants. Because if you do, there are so many problems you can resolve by just talking it through, as opposed to I'll see you in court. Um, and that's just me. It's based on experience and it's based learning the hard way. At the end of the day, you're dealing with human beings. And uh, human beings generally uh, like to feel appreciated. 
and like to have a positive relationship with uh, you know with their employer with their landlord or whatever they do and uh, so i try to cultivate that some tenants you just don't want to have a positive relationship there because they're just tenants from hell and that's where your screening came in uh and maybe that's something to do with you or it's just just where they are some people have got problems and because they got problems they want to make sure that you have problems as well and so they're not happy there's nothing you can do to satisfy them they're just unhappy and uh their life is hell so they're going to make your life hell as well that's just unfortunate some people are like that uh but most people are not and most people i think are responsive to good positive relationships and things like that address number 10 address late fees proactively what's the time 723 i'll wrap this up in about five minutes uh address late fees proactively um you know i like to if it, if it, if you know if the tenant if the rent is not paid i like to reach out to the tenant very quickly and uh try to understand what's going on uh, i don't drag it out you know and cross my fingers and hope for the best no you you be proactive uh listen to the concerns uh if anything and uh some tenants like i have one tenant who uh you know i was having difficulty reaching out to her because the phone was disconnected and uh in the end i had to contact uh, a relative uh, to reach out to that person to ask them to call me. Um, you know, but I got that person relative's number through the application that they submitted to me in the first place. So listen to their concerns, work together if possible. And uh, be but because I found that being proactive in resolving uh, late fee issues uh, can prevent the issue from escalating. And also it can improve your rent collection rates in the long run. Uh, what I did, this, what I do once a month is with my my administrative assistant, I did one today with her, uh, which is uh, to gauge how we're doing in terms of a lot of different metrics. We call it, anyway, I don't want to get it down there. Uh, but, you know, we we track uh, how, how our tenants pay and uh, what's the percentage, um, you know, payment uh, for, all, um, you know, rates for all my uh, tenants. And we track that, we monitor that, we measure that, and so on. So that's what I do. Uh, I just like to be proactive. Number 12, uh, number 11, I'm sorry, is uh, conduct regular inspections. Uh, you may think, well, what's the regular rent inspections got to do with uh, uh, collecting rent? Uh, it's linked uh, because by you going to the house uh, every now and then, maybe every six months, every three months, every year, whatever you want to do, you can gauge the condition of the property. Uh, because there are some tenants, if, um, you know, if you're not staying on top of the house, they'll use that as an excuse not to pay your rent. And, uh, or if they're breaking the lease, then you don't know. And, uh, but, you know, uh, inspections, visits to the home will allow you to, um, you know, understand how your property is being kept. And also you can be proactive in making sure that, uh, you know, these problems, if they're encountering, uh, don't escalate to the point whereby they refuse to pay rent or uh, or even worse, they move out. So conduct re regular inspections. And also you'll find that if there's any unauthorized uh, occupants in the home. Number 12, uh, encourage direct debit authorization. I think I mentioned that earlier on, automated payments. Um, you know, there are soft software out there uh, where you can do ACH transfer directly. They can pay by credit card, the rent. You can also do... Um, uh, what do you call that thing? Uh, pay directly uh, from their payroll straight into your account or bank to bank transfer. There's lots of different ways now where you can sort of automate that whole uh, rent collection process and so on. So, in conclusion, I'm wrapping it up, uh, my friends. Uh, maximizing rent collection is critical, it's a critical aspect in your business. It really is. Uh, a successful landlords have this down pat. Uh, hopefully, the, uh, you know, the tips I provided today. Uh, will help you and uh, because you need to enhance your co rent collection rates you do um, you know cash flow is key to your survival and collection rent is important uh, but in order to do that I think that you need to have positive relationship with your tenants you need to build the positive relationship with tenants and uh, and so invest some time in that and uh, because that will help you in terms of uh, maintaining your cash flow and uh, also have tenants who are going to take care of your property. So, uh, you know, in addition to that, you want to have effective communications. 
transparent rent policies and be proactive in terms of problem solving. You know, these are the key components uh, in order to achieve on-time payments and consistent payment, uh, which are also likely to increase the chance of you having long-term success. So remember, consistently implementing these strategies, the ones I just talked about today, will contribute to your successful and profitable buy and hold landlord business. Hope that was helpful, my friends. That's it. So uh, we're going to go to Q&A now. So if you've got some questions, please put them in the, in the uh, chat box, and I'm going to try to get to them shortly. If you have some, uh, if you want to shoot me an email, you can reach me at email at joe at joeasimo.com, joe at joeasimo.com. And uh, I will try to respond. I'm not always the greatest. You can always meet me on, uh, or at least DM me on uh, social media, either on Instagram or also on Facebook. So with that said, my friends, I'm going to go to the Q&A session. Okay, let's have a look. What do we have here? So Marlon, good evening, Marlon. I hope you're doing well. And I uh, hope that business is going fine for you. And so on. So. James Sandman. Hey, James. Uh, appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you as well. And let's have a little. Hello, everybody. This is from B. Francis. Hope you're doing well, B. Francis. And uh, let's have who? DCC here from Houston. Hey, DCC. Hope you're doing well in Houston. And uh, oh, yeah. So next week, I think I'll be back. So I will be back for next week for uh, Wealth Wednesday, another live session. So I should be good for that. So, again, if you've got some questions, put them in the chat box and I'll try and get to you. Okay, Marlon, uh, how do you handle a tenant who has someone living in the property who is not on the lease or a HAP contract? Okay, so the scenario here is that uh, Marlon has uh, a tenant who is who has somebody living in the home. So uh, they told you that, let's just say, they're going to have five people in the house. And they sneaked in a, uh, a sixth person or a seventh person or whatever it is. And that person is not authorized to be there. Uh, they're not on the lease. They're not on the uh, voucher contract, which is called a HAP contract. And they were not, uh, you know, sort of uh, on the application form when they, uh, you know, filled out, they didn't include that person. So what do you do now? They're in the house. So a couple of things you can do. Uh, one is. Uh, you know, technically, it's a lease violation, okay? And uh, if it's a lease violation, then your recourse is through the court system. So you can take them to court and, uh, you know, and pursue that track, okay? If you, The problem is going to be you're going to have to prove that they have somebody who is living there who is not supposed to be. So you're going to have to provide evidence. And the tenant may say, well, you're on a, you know, the person is not living here. And then you now have to say, well, they are living here. And this is the reason why I say that. OK, so you have to have some evidence, either photographs, uh, communications with the tenant or whatever. Uh, then you have to they may say, well, your honor, uh, this person is living with me as a guest. OK, they're not a, a, a tenant. So then you have to have in your lease the definition of a guest. Uh, I know in my lease is a, a, a guest is anybody that stays less than 14 days so if they stay less than 14 days technically they're a guest not an occupant so if this person obviously is staying uh you know more than 14 days in a 12 month period then they are technically a, a tenant so again uh you can include them on the lease you can turn a blind eye if you want to it's up to you it depends if that person is disruptive or if that person is just you know a nuisance um you know i've had situations where tenants have brought in their boyfriends okay and some boyfriends are very helpful. They provide stability in a home. And some of them can be very disruptive. And so you're going to have to kind of make a choice. If they're disrupt disruptive type, then, you know, you can ask them to vacate. And they're not on the lease. Because if it's a voucher holder, if they're not on the lease and have someone living there, technically they could lose their voucher. So you could use that sort of stick uh, against the tenant as well. So you've got several options you can do. You can uh, take them to court. Uh, you can have a conversation with the tenant and say, I'm sorry, but this person can't stay here and, uh, and, and, and kind of work it out that way. Uh, they may agree to remove that person or may not. 
And also you have the leverage of contacting the housing authority and saying that this person is, uh, this uh, voucher holder has a person in a home that's not supposed to be there. And uh, the caseworker will then contact the tenant and let them know that uh, this is part, this is a violation of their agreement with section eight and they could lose their voucher because of that. Okay, so you do have some um, uh, options available to you, Marlon, if you want to do that. Hopefully, you know, if, if hopefully I answer your question. If I didn't, then, you know, feel free to come back and, uh, uh, you know, and re respond. Okay, another question from Marlon. Uh, what is the process if I don't want to continue leasing to a voucher holder? What is the process? It depends where you are, Marlon. Uh, if you're in Washington, D.C., uh, then yeah, it's, it's going to get a little tricky. Uh, the reason why I say that, it's not just for a voucher holder, it's for any tenant. Uh, unless they are val violating the, the terms of your lease, they essentially are able to stay there forever, indefinitely. Uh, so that's just DC law. That's got nothing to do with Section 8 program. That's just how the, the tenant law, landlord-tenant laws are in DC. It's very pro-tenant. So uh, if you have a tenant who's not paying you and uh, you want them out of your house, uh, if they're not violating a, 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 a lease term, then, uh, you know, you're going to have to have a conversation with them. You can, uh, because technically in DC, there's only about a few ways where you can evict somebody. Uh, one of them is to, um, you know, you want to use the property as your primary residence. Uh, there's a, just about four or five ways you can, uh, that are legal that you can get somebody out who's not paying, who's abiding by the terms of their lease, but you want them out. It's not like some jurisdictions where all you got to do is give them a 30 day notice and that's it. DC is a little funny. So it depends what jurisdiction you are. And uh, if you don't want to continue leasing to that voucher holder, then you can have a conversation with the tenant and say, Hey, I, I want to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to participate in this program anymore. And uh, you can then encourage them to start looking for a property. And uh, so what they'll do is to notify the housing authority, get a briefing, and uh, they'll issue them a new voucher, and then they can start looking. The problem is that if you've got a nice house in a nice area, is that they kind of get used to living in a nice house in a nice area. So they may not find uh, something that's comparable uh, you know, to where they are and, uh, and so on. So it's going to be a challenge. It can be done uh, because when I have properties... I always get tenants who say, well, the reason why I'm moving is because my landlord is trying to sell the house. The reason why I'm moving is because the landlord, you know, wants me out for whatever reason and uh, and so on. So the sneaky way you can do this is real, real sneaky. I don't recommend it, but it is what it is. And that is, uh, you know, you can you can violate the program rules by not fixing the property or, uh, you know, by not passing the inspection or whatever it is then in that case, then the, you'll, the, you know, the, you'll get dinged by the housing authority uh, and then they will abate your payments, which means that they won't pay you. And then they'll give the tenant a new voucher to go find something else. So that's kind of a sneaky way that some landlords do. I don't recommend that, but, you know, that's a tricky way as well. Okay. If a housing choice voucher tenant pays a rent late, is a late fee on the total amount owned or just the tenant's portion? So what, uh, uh, what's it called? Marlon's asking here is that if you have a if you have a, a voucher tenant and the rent's a thousand dollars, let's say uh, the housing authority pays nine hundred and the tenant pays one hundred. Just keep it simple, round numbers. So he wants to know is the late fee that the tenant pays based on the total rent, which is a thousand dollars. Or is it based on the hundred dollars that the tenant pays in DC? It's based on the hundred dollars that the tenant pays, not the thousand dollars of the total rent, because the tenant's only responsible for the hundred dollars. The assumption is that the housing authority is responsible for the nine hundred, and it's very rare that they pay late. So, but the tenant's portion is only a hundred. So, you know, you you charge the late fee based on the hundred dollars and not the thousand dollars. Okay, hope that helps. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Joe. Great intro. Hi, Johnny H. Hope you're doing well. And uh, so on. So again, if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box and I'll try to get to them. I'm going to try and, I don't think so, but I'll try and finish, see if I can finish a little early today since I have to go off to Canada tomorrow. 
DCC, why do you prefer your thoughtful Section 8 single-family home approach over all of this multifamily investment excitement? Uh -huh. The grass is always greener on the other side. I know it's, it's you know, I don't know, multifamily is a sexy way. It, it sounds good. It, you know, a lot of the gurus are kind of pitching that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I've just found that the single-family way, which is what I do, it's slow and steady. And, uh, you know, I like it. I get one family and uh, my families tend to stay a long time. Um, you know, especially the tier one tenants that I'm looking for. So my whole business model is about getting tier one tenants to come to my homes, which are usually nice houses in nice areas, and they stay a long time. Uh, I'm averaging around seven years per tenant across my, multi, uh, my portfolio. Uh, whereas if I had a bunch of multifamilies, uh, I found that multifamilies, uh, I, I just get high turnovers and turnover can be very, very expensive. So you may think you're making money, but really, you're not really making as much as you think you are. So uh, it's what I know. It's what I sort of perfected. And sometimes the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Uh, again, everyone's each to their own. If you like the multifamily approach, fine. No, there's nothing wrong with it. People do it all the time. I just prefer a six, uh, simple Section 8 family single family rentals um and uh, and it works for me and it was working for me i have a, a bunch of single family homes uh, it's got a lot of equity uh if i want it across the board if i want to sell one it's easier to sell and um you know there's just a lot more buyers for single families than there are for multi-family so you know it's what i do i'm not saying you should do it but it's just what i do and that's what i'm encouraging other people to consider Okay, how much should a landlord charge in late fees? It depends, uh, Lewis. Um, you know, I typically charge 5%. I think in D.C., that's the law. Uh, so some jurisdictions, you can only uh, charge uh, a certain amount as late charge. Uh, uh, typically, it's a certain percentage of the rent. Or you can charge in other jurisdictions, you can charge whatever you want for late fees. So uh, I typically charge uh, 5%. So, uh, you know, for my... Uh, late fees for my tenants. Okay, uh, Roxanne Billy, what type of paperwork is required from the property manager for the real estate investing management? Oh, what type of paperwork is required from the property manager to the real estate investor manage the rental property? I am a new investor and I'm trying to establish a relationship with my property manager. Okay, so you're a new investor. You uh, decided you want to have a property manager manage your property for you rather than you doing it yourself. Fine. Uh, so what type of paperwork is required? You need a, a what we call a, uh, a property management agreement uh, between you and the management company that states the terms and uh, conditions of your relationship. Uh, so in that was going to be the terms of the, the, the agreement between, you know, um, it's the formal agreement between you two, uh, essentially what you're doing is you're, you're authorizing them to act on your behalf, uh, to managing that relationship with the tenant, collecting rent, screening tenants, managing day-to-day -day operations, uh, you know, overseeing evictions and uh, all that stuff. It should be, you are given the right to the property management company to manage that property or that tenant or that relationship on your behalf. So uh, that's the key document you want that. Uh, typically the management company will have their own leases, will have all their own agreements, will have their own notices and things like that. So you need to have a relationship agreement between yourself and the management company. Uh, and that will also set the terms in terms of that relationship, in terms of uh, you know how they get paid and how much the, uh, are they charging you as a percentage of the, um, you know, the, the total rent and the roles and responsibilities and things like that. So hopefully that will help. That, hopefully that helps answer your question. Uh, the key is the, the management agreement. So, I, so for me, although I manage my own properties, I'm not really managing my own properties, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, I have a management company, which I own, manages the properties on behalf of me. So there's the owner of the real estate and there's a management company that manages the properties on behalf of the owner. Okay. And so I don't own, I don't manage the properties as Joe. I manage the properties 
as a representative of my management company. Okay, so there's sort of a uh, a, a level of separation between the tenant and uh, Joe, the owner. And that's the Joe, the management company. Okay, that's what I do. And uh, and that's what I was advised to do by my uh, CPA and also my attorney as well. Okay, DCC, you had a successful career as a PhD. When did you decide to leave your day job for career for real estate investment? Okay. Um, yeah, I think you know my story. I came to the US uh, in 85, October the 17th, 7.30, and so on. And uh, I worked a regular job like everybody else uh, was doing. And uh, my boss had got fired. Uh, he said, me, you know, we had a conversation. He suggested I look into real estate. I bought my first house. Uh, he suggested to me, whatever you do, Joe, uh, if you buy anything, keep it, don't sell it. And that was the reason why I got into the buy and hold. And, uh, you know, so I started buying and I was still working. Uh, I still build a, a portfolio very slowly. And uh, I reached the point in 2003, June the 6th, when my income from my job, and I was working at IBM at that time, uh, equaled what I was making at uh, my rental properties. So that was my plan B. And I was able to eat my, each, reach that milestone in uh, June 2003. And uh, that's what I was able to transition from being a full time employee to a full-time real estate investor. It wasn't easy. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy journey. It was difficult. Uh, but, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of running around the country. Uh, the job I had, um, I used to spend months, over, you know, uh, across the country, whether it be in California, Florida, uh, you know, Michigan, New York, whatever. And um, But I still had these rental portfolios. So I had to have systems in place and I had to have relationships in place in order to be able to manage this portfolio, because I was managing it all myself uh, without physically being present seven days a week in the local DMV area. So this is how that's how I did it. Uh, it's always been a goal to have a plan B. Uh, I really enjoyed my I loved my job. But, you know, at, at some point I kind of got tired of it and wanted the flexibility of um, and the freedom really to do more of what I wanted to do. I, I love being a landlord. Um, you know, I'm making money, yes, but I'm also doing good. I'm providing housing for a lot of families and, uh, and I'm changing lives. I make a difference in a lot of people's lives. So that's why I, I, I love it. I enjoy it. And it's given me the opportunity to, to travel, uh, develop relationships with key people. And, um, you know, and I think it's given me a purpose as well. So that's just me. That's my story. And uh, hopefully uh, I can um, motivate you incentivize you um you know so that way you can start building your portfolio and hopefully you can attain financial independence uh through real estate okay uh johnny h great question marlon appreciate the responses dr joe that helps okay good so hopefully that was helpful uh what software do you use to collect rent eg turbo tenant rent ready uh thank you for answering i know if we do we use rent ready uh, which is a software program, online software program, uh, you know, and I think if you're a bigger pockets, uh, uh, pro member, it's, it's one of the perks that they give you. Uh, that's what we use. Some people use turbo rent. Some people use what's the other ones, uh, uh, buildium and uh, folio. There's a whole bunch of them. And, uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of them out there and they do, a lot of them do, uh, try to automate that rent collection process uh, so that way tenants' payments go directly to your account and so on. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joe Bilal. This is from uh, Roxanne Bilal. Uh, okay, so we're going to wrap this up shortly. And so if you've got some more questions, um, you know, put them in now. Otherwise, I'm off to Canada. So, uh, Marlon, is it a violation of the lease to use that address if you don't live there? Is it a violation of a lease to use that address? I'm not too sure if I understand the question, Marlon. You, you may have to clarify. Is it a violation of a lease to use that address? Which address? If you don't live there. So they use, it sounds like they are, the tenant is you or somebody is using that address, your property address where the tenant lives, but they don't live there. 
uh i'm not too sure why they're doing this uh or what you you're gonna need to clarify that mom i'm not too sure I, I i need some more background as to the circumstances going on here uh so that way i can answer the question properly so typically the only person that can live can use your address is if they are a tenant at the house so if they're not a tenant at the house uh you know then uh, why are they using your address? So um, let's have a look. Correct. Is it a violation to of a lease to use the, that address if you don't live there? So I'm assuming that somebody's not supposed to live there, but they're using that address for either mail or for whatever they're doing. And uh, is that a lease violation? Good question. I don't know if it's a lease violation to use that address uh, for mail or whatever, because people do that all the time. Uh, but a violation is the lease. Are they living there? Because uh, if they're not living there and they're using that address just for mail, I, I don't know if that's a lease violation. Uh, but if they are living there and they're not supposed to be living there, uh, because they're not on the lease, that is definitely a lease violation. So uh, you're going to have to clarify what the scenario is uh, to this, Marlon. But I think that uh, just using an address for a mail, mail forwarding, mail collection or whatever, maybe somebody says, hey, where I live, the, the, you know, collection mail is not safe because people steal mail or whatever. Can I use this address for my, all my communications? So, you know, so the person uses your address just for mail. I don't think that's the least part. You're going to have a hard time trying to evict somebody based on that. Uh, but if they are living there and they're not supposed to be there, then yes, I agree. That is a definite lease violation uh, and so on. So I hope you would make a session of your systems, uh, make a session on your systems to become a nearly passive investor, e.g. person, systems, bookkeeper, property manager, owning, hiring. Yeah, good question, DCC. Uh, maybe I'll do a session on uh, behind the scenes, what do I have in place uh, for my business? Uh, because it is a business. I run it as a business. Um, you know, I have an assistant. Um, she's overseas. In fact, she's in Ghana. And the virtual assistant, uh, I meet with her twice, uh, twice a week, in fact. And she's been really, really instrumental uh, for a lot of the automated systems I'm, I'm putting together today. Uh, today, and um, you know, she's she's definitely an asset, and uh, and so on. So yes, yeah, so uh, I may have a, a session one day on quote unquote my systems. What do I do? And but if you're a part of my programs, then obviously you'll be able to get access to a lot of that stuff anyway through the virtual webinars that we do. Uh, I'm not too sure when I'm going to have another program, but uh, stay tuned. They don't live there, but they use the address. Okay, so if they don't live there, but they use that address, I don't know if that's. I don't know if you. I, I don't know if that's a lease violation. It could be technically. Whether you, I'm not too sure if you want to evict them because of that especially if they're paying their rent uh to me don't sweat the small stuff just collect your rent as long as the main people are in living in the house are taking care of your house no drama you know and uh paying the rent on time and uh they intend to stay there a long time i don't think you gain anything by evicting them just because they're using that address for their mail uh but they don't live there to me i don't know pick your battles that's not a battle I'll pick uh, and fight on. It's not worth it to me. Uh, especially if you want to, if you want to fight that battle, then uh, you know they may now. Yeah, you know, you're gonna start developing an adversarial relationship to me uh, with the tenant, and uh, and what do you gain out of that? I don't know. But uh, hopefully that was helpful, Marlon. And uh, yeah, a wise man once told me. Uh, the key to success in life is to pick your battles. Uh, so some battles are worth fighting and some battles are not worth fighting. So I don't know if this is one that's worth fighting. I'll leave that to you tomorrow. Uh, but uh, hopefully you'll do the right thing, whichever way it goes. Okay, my friends, I think that's it for today. Uh, we had a good session on rents 
and collecting rent. I shared with you a lot of my strategies that I use to collect rent and uh, and so on. So next week I am tomorrow, in fact, I'm off to uh, I'm off to Toronto for some partying at the Caravana, which is a Caribbean festival in Toronto, Canada. Heading out tomorrow, coming back uh, a week later. Uh, I think I'll be back on Wednesday morning, I think it is. So I'll be back here, I think, for another live session on Wealth Wednesday. And then towards the end of the month, I'll try and do a networking event at one of my properties in Washington, D.C. So again, hopefully today was helpful. And uh, if you want to shoot me an email, you know, feel free to uh, reach me on uh, joe at joeasamoa.com. And I will try to return your email. Have yourself a wonderful evening. And I'll speak to you next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Facebook and also on YouTube. Good night.